This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Let's say you're walking through an airport trying to get to your terminal as fast as possible. Now throughout this airport is of course those moving walkways to help you travel faster and for simplicity let's just say this airport is a one dimensional segment and no one else is there to slow you down. Now how would you answer these two questions? First suppose you see your shoe is untied and you must stop at some point before the terminal to tie it. Is it more efficient to tie it on the walkway, off the walkway, or does not matter? Then question two is, suppose you have to walk throughout this airport, but you have enough energy to sprint for a short period of time. Where is it more efficient to do that sprint? On or off the walkway, or again, it doesn't matter. Terence Tao, who many regard as one of the greatest living mathematicians, introduced this problem a little over a decade ago on his blog actually, and it got a lot of attention. Now for the first question, likely your intuition was correct. It is more efficient to tie your shoes on the walkway. To avoid the technical math, imagine you're racing your twin across this airport, and as you both approach a walkway, you tie your shoe right before getting on, and they tie their shoe right after. After you're both done, at roughly the same time, your twin will be ahead of you, such that there's no way for you to catch up. For the second part, regarding the best time to start sprinting, let's use some mostly reasonable numbers. Let's say there's 50 meters of normal ground, then 50 meters of walkway. We'll say you can walk at 2 meters per second, you can sprint at 7 meters per second for a max of 5 seconds, and the walkway moves at 1 meter per second. Okay, let's first analyze a person who will sprint only on the walkway. This means they walk the first 50 meters, and at 2 meters per second that will take 25 seconds. Once they get to the walkway and start sprinting, their speed will be 8 meters per second relative to the ground, or the sprinting speed plus the walkway speed. So after the 5 seconds they're allowed to sprint, they'll have traveled 40 meters and have only 10 more to go. During those 10 meters, they'd move at 3 meters per second relative to the ground, so that time would be 3.33 seconds, giving us a total time of 33.33 seconds. Now let's compare that to the same person who sprints while off the walkway. If this person just starts sprinting immediately, they will move at 7 meters per second for 5 seconds, and thus travel 35 meters. Then with 15 meters to go until the walkway, at 2 meters per second it will take them 7.5 seconds. They would then walk the entire walkway at a relative speed of 3 meters per second to the ground, so to move 50 meters would take them 16.66 seconds. We add all those times up and get 29.16 seconds, which is faster than the other person. If you want more detail regarding a real mathematical proof to this, I'll put links below. But overall, the rule is you stop when you're on the walkway and you sprint when you're off it. Now let's switch gears to a purely logical problem. Let's say there are four cards on the table labeled A, B, 5, and 6. Then I tell you if there's an A on one side of the card, there's definitely a 5 on the other side. The question is which cards must you flip over in order to determine whether I'm telling the truth? Most people who answer this too quickly do get it wrong. In fact, about 90% of people don't get this at first. If your answer is the A and 5, by the way, that is incorrect. But if you answer just A, that is still incorrect. The correct answer is you need to flip over the A and the 6. You may see the reasoning, but let me ask another quick question first. Let's say that we're at a bar in the United States where they say anyone under 21 years old cannot have alcohol. Now imagine there are four people at the bar all drinking something. The only information you have is that person one is 19 years old, person two is 22 years old, person three is drinking a soda, and person four is having a beer. Now the question is which of these customers do you need to investigate further to see if the bar is breaking the law? Most people have no issue with this problem as you need to check the 19 year old to see what they're drinking and you need to check the person drinking a beer to see how old they are. But the thing is, this is essentially the same question I asked before with the same answers. You have to flip over the A card, because if the other side is a 5, the rule is not broken. If it's anything else though, then the rule is broken. Just like with the 19 year old, what they're drinking will decide whether the law is being broken or not. Then the 5 does not need to be flipped over, because it doesn't matter what's on the other side. If there is an A, then the rule is not broken, of course. On the other hand, if there's maybe a C behind it, the rule is still not broken, because I only said if there's an A, then there must be a 5 behind it. Other letters don't matter. This is just like someone drinking a soda. 
whether they're over or under 21, that changes nothing because I can already confidently say the law is not being broken. Then lastly, the six must be flipped over because we have to see if there's an A behind it. If there is, the rule is broken. If not, then we're fine. And of course, the same thing applies to the person drinking beer. Okay, now we're going to move on to something completely different. Let's say there's a village that for some reason needs to be repopulated, but this village has a certain rule, and that rule is you are only allowed to have one male child, and once you do, you can no longer have any more children. However, you can have as many girls as you want. In fact, we'll say if you do have a girl, you have to keep having children until you eventually get a boy. Now, the question is, after a long period of time, what fraction of the population is expected to be girls? Not counting parents, by the way, just the children. Turns out this question is much more controversial than you may think. In fact, I was reading this book, which I highly recommend if you like the kinds of questions I'm putting in this video, as a lot of them are in here. But the author actually posted this question on his forum years ago, and it sparked probably the biggest debate of any question he ever posted. And the reason is because when you look up this question on Google, you find a bunch of answers that say what I'm sure many of you are thinking, that the expected fraction of girls will be 50% or one half. That's because no matter what the parents do, they have a 50% chance of having a girl and a 50% chance of having a boy. So regardless of any rule they put in place, you can't change that expected outcome. But this doesn't fully answer what the question was really asking, which is what the author talks about. So let's do some analysis on a village with let's say 32 couples on it. If they all have a kid, assuming no twins, there will be 16 boys and 16 girls. Now the 16 couples that had a boy are done having kids but the other 16 will keep going. From there, the new set of births would yield eight boys and eight girls, and then again, those who have had boys are done having children, while the rest keep going. The next sets of children come out to four and four, then two and two, one and one, and let me stop there. Now, if we look at the breakdown of the families, you'll find there are 16, or half of the total, with one boy and no girls. Eight families have one boy and one girl, four families have one boy and two girls, and so on. But at the end of the day, the number of boys and girls should be the same. However, this doesn't answer the original question. The question was saying if we had a bunch of villages with some number of people in each, and we found the percentage of girls in each one of those, what would be the average of those values? Here, let me make this simpler real quick. Imagine every day you flip a coin in the morning. If it's heads, you eat four eggs for breakfast, and if it's tails, you eat two pancakes. So let's just say on Monday you flip heads and eat four eggs. That means 100% of what you ate was eggs. If the next day you flip tails, you'd eat two pancakes, meaning 0% of what you ate was eggs. The next day, if it was heads again, you'd eat four eggs, which is again 100%, and we'll assume tails for the fourth day, which would match Tuesday. So the average of those percentages is 50%. That means on average, the percentage of items that are eggs is 50%. However, in total, we've eaten 12 items and eight of them were eggs. On average, you eat more eggs than pancakes, yet the average percentage is another story. And this is the very subtle issue with the population problem. Let's assume every village has one couple in it. That means for half the villages, the fraction of girls will be zero, which happens when the first child born is a boy. For one fourth of the villages, girls will make up one half of the children, which happens when a girl is born first followed by a boy. For one eighth of the villages, girls make up two thirds of the children, one sixteenth of the villages will have three fourths girls, and so on. Now if we calculate that expected fraction by multiplying the probability by the fraction of girls in each case, we get one minus the natural log of two, or about 30.69%. So yes, we do expect the number of boys and girls to be equal, yet the expected fraction or percentage of those that are girls is not one half or 50%. But this is only if every village has one couple. If instead every village had two couples, then the expected percentage of girls would be 38.63%. For 10 families, it'd be 47.51%. And for 1,000 families, it'd be 49.98%. So as the total population approaches infinity, the expected percentage of women approaches 50%. Yet for small populations, the expected fraction is not 50%, even though we do expect the same number of boys and girls. After seeing this, it may seem pointless to even care about this expected fraction, especially in the real world. And I know we made a lot of assumptions that really don't reflect reality, like a couple can have infinitely many kids and things like that. But with regards to this very theoretical problem and the question that was being asked, the math does work out. Next up, we're going to play the very famous St. Petersburg Lottery. 
but for people who have seen it, we're also going to play one with a twist on it. For this game, we're going to flip a coin until it lands heads. If it lands heads on the first flip, you get $2. If it takes two flips, you get $4. If it takes three flips, $8. Four flips, $16. And the payout just doubles forever. Clearly, this is a good game to play, but how much would you pay to play it, assuming you could play over and over? Well, it'd definitely be worth it to pay $2 each time you play, because you'd either break even or make some money. But would $5 be worth it, or $10, or $50, and so on? Well, it turns out, in theory, paying any amount of money would be worth it. You could pay a billion dollars every time, and you'd still make money in the long run. But let me stress, it would be the very long run. The reason is because if you calculate that expected value, you find that half the time you'll win $2, which would happen when heads comes up first. A fourth of the time you'd win $4, an eighth of the time you'd win $8, a sixteenth of the time $16, and so on. The payout and probability reduce to 1 every time, and since this is an infinite sum, your expected payout is infinity. But when people are asked to play this game, most won't pay even more than about $25. Which shows that humans aren't very good at understanding expected outcomes. Or are they? Because we need to know that this game is very dependent on those much larger outcomes. The fact that one in a trillion times you'll win a trillion dollars is very crucial here. In fact, let's say the person offering this game only has a hundred dollars. Meaning if it came to a point where you're supposed to win more than that, they would just give you the full 100. So basically, when looking at all those expected payouts, the higher ones would just turn into $100. In this case, the expected payout per round is only $7.56. And if the person had a billion dollars, the expected outcome would be $30.86. And if the person playing this had the world's GDP or $54.3 trillion available to them, you wouldn't pay them any more than $46.54 to play this game. So when someone says they'll pay only, let's say, $20 for this game, they're in fact being more reasonable. But then Brilliant has a version I'd never seen before with a slight variation. Suppose now you get $2 if heads comes up on the first or second flip. If it comes up on the third or fourth flip, you get $4, fifth or sixth gives you $8, and so on. So you really get the same payouts, just delayed a little bit. What would you say this game is worth now if there was infinite money and time available? Well, the new answer is $3, because if we calculate the expected value where we get $2, one half plus a fourth of the time, along with $4, one eighth plus one sixteenth of the time, and so on forever, this results in an infinite series that converges to three. So yes, with that seemingly slight change in payouts, the expected value is now completely different. And now let's see a small twist on a very famous probability puzzle. I'm sure many of you watching this know about the Monty Hall problem, where you're on a game show and have a choice of three doors, behind two of which are goats and behind one is a car. You pick a door not knowing what's behind it, and then the host opens one of the other doors revealing a goat, and then asks you if you'd like to switch your choice. Most people instinctively think it doesn't matter whether you switch or not, but in fact if you switch you'll have a two-thirds chance of selecting the car. The reason is because there are three scenarios to this. Two where you initially pick a door with a goat, and one where you initially pick the car. In all scenarios, the game show host will reveal a goat and then ask you if you want to switch. And in two out of three of these, if you switch to the unopened door, you win. But for the other one, you'd lose, thus you have a two out of three chance of winning. If you had not switched doors, then in two of the three cases where you originally picked the goat, you would have lost. Now I have a slightly different question though. What if you play the game, and after you pick a door, before the host says anything, your drunken friend who's in the audience runs on stage and opens a door because they can't stand the anticipation of waiting for the reveal. We'll assume your door is locked, but they open one of the others, and behind it you see a goat. Security then kicks your friend out, but the host says, you know what, we'll still give you a chance to switch. What do you do? The answer is, well, never let that friend come with you to game shows anymore, because they have ruined the edge you would have gotten. Surprisingly, in this scenario, you have no reason to switch doors. It is a 50-50 probability either way that you win the car. See, I thought I totally understood the Monty Hall problem, but once I saw this, I was back to being confused. I mean, whether it's your friend or the game show host opening the door, in both cases you're staring at a goat and have the option to switch. But how the door was opened, as in whether it was random or not, totally changes the probability. To avoid too much of the technical math, let's look at this intuitively. Imagine 18 people will play this game one after the other. 
For simplicity, let's just say this will be the setup every single time, but of course the players don't know that. Now, since 18 people are playing, that means we can expect there to be 6 people who choose door 1, 6 people who choose door 2, and 6 who choose door 3. And we'll say every single time, their friend decides to run up and randomly open one of the other doors. So of the 6 people who chose door 1, 3 of them will witness their friend reveal a goat. The other 3 will see the car revealed, since there's a 50-50 chance of each one happening. We only care about the 3 who see the goat revealed though, since that was the original question. Then of the 6 who chose door number 2, again 3 will see their friend reveal a goat. But of the 6 who chose door 3, all of them will see their friend reveal a goat, since the friend can only open door 1 or 2. So here are all the people that are now looking at a goat faced with a choice to switch. If everyone switches, then the people that originally chose door 1 will win the car, since door 2 was revealed to them and they'd switch to 3. Those that originally chose door 2 will also win for the same reason but those that chose door 3 will lose. So of the 12 people here, 6 will win and 6 will lose, or 50-50. As in when you're playing this game someday and your friend randomly opens a door revealing a goat, just remember you're one of these people. You don't know which, but I can tell you if you switch, or if you don't, there's a 50% chance you're one of the winners and a 50% chance you're one of the losers. That two-thirds probability is completely gone. And there are many more variations to this game, such as adding more doors, or even assigning different probabilities to each door. I can't talk about them all, but if you want to explore these further, you can do so at Brilliant.org, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is an educational platform that hosts a wide variety of math and science courses. They not only teach you the technical information you need to know for the various subjects, but they also challenge you constantly along the way with practice problems so you have a real fundamental understanding of what you're learning. If you enjoyed this video and like challenging questions that change your way of looking at a problem, then you'll very likely enjoy their logic course that explores puzzles and riddles, questions that involve deeper levels of thinking, and competitive games that will test your mathematical reasoning. Logic courses are seen in just about every computer science department actually. Plus this type of course is a stepping stone from high school level math to university level as it introduces you to the kind of thinking that is required as a mathematician. Brilliant also includes daily challenges that turn learning into a habit. These questions range from what happens when you cut a Mobius strip in half, to probability games within quantum systems, and much more to give you a range of topics to look forward to learning. Plus they now have offline courses for iOS and Android, so you can download some of your favorite courses right to your phone. You can learn something new and stay productive whether you're commuting to work or school, traveling, or just somewhere with terrible internet. So if you want to get started right now and support the channel, you can click the link below or go to brilliant.org slash major prep to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe, follow me on Twitter and join the major prep Facebook group for updates on everything, and I'll see you all in the next video.